Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for coming to this 20th Annual Land and Reducing Poverty uh, Conference. 20 years is a long time, and this conference has become a staple in the uh, development uh, scene in terms of new ideas, innovations that uh, uh, help uh, poor people, but not just poor people in rural areas, also in um, urban areas, to better utilize the assets that, uh, that they have. Um, there have been already some, uh, some meetings and events today. We look forward to um, several other days of uh, exchanges on uh, what works, how it works, how can we spread good practices around, uh, around the world. So we will start uh, uh, this uh, afternoon, if you like, or evening session with our president, Kristalina Georgieva, who um, has had uh, experience actually in this field, both in post-communist uh, transition, where topics of uh, land ownership, then modern land registration, um, have been uh, very prominent and with some success. Um, and uh, more generally, where uh, this topic uh, uh, helps uh, also f with particular groups like women, because we know from research how, uh, particularly in uh, rural areas, uh, the majority of people who can benefit from land registration uh, and, in general, um, uh, improvements uh, in uh, land titles, land ownership, are, uh, are women. So we will start with uh, some opening remarks by our president, and then we will go to the distinguished panel of policy makers. We'll have questions and answers, and then uh, a view from academia, some of the latest research on um, geospatial uh, satellite imagery and how this can uh, help the world be a better place. Uh, so we'll start with our president, Kristalina Georgieva. Kristalina. Thank you very much, Simeon, and uh, welcome to all who are uh, joining us uh, for this uh, very important 20th anniversary of the World Annual World Bank Conference uh, on Land and Property. I want to thank you and those who are in the overflow room and those who are online for your support to move an agenda that matters tremendously to everyone, but in particular to poor people who depend on us to move it forward so they can have the rights over their land. Uh, let me start with a, um, a personal story. Simeon mentioned that I have some exposure to this topic. I was eight when my uh, grandfather uh, got a stroke because his uh, house and the land around it was nationalized. No consultation, no place to appeal. And we uh, lost him a couple of years later. I was in my 30s when my country, Bulgaria, took a turn towards market economy. And one of the drivers for the country to step forward happened to be the fact that house ownership in the country was still quite high. Around 75% of Bulgarians owned their apartments. So I had the pain of my grandfather, but also the gain of my father and mother who had their apartment. And by having this right, they actually had the discipline to pay for electricity, for water, to have that feeling of what ownership actually means. It is a right and it is a responsibility. And I came here to the World Bank uh, to see how we as institution can advance the rights of people, and in particular, the rights of people over their destiny. And part of it is ownership and in particular for the millions of people for whom this is still rare luxury. Only 30% of the world's population has a legally registered title on their land. For them, it is so very important that we relentlessly pursue this agenda. And we do it 
with an eye on the most vulnerable, the underprivileged, those who do not have their voices easily heard in the high corridors of power. I am proud of what the World Bank is doing in this area. Let me give you two examples. One is about the rights of indigenous people. In uh, Nicaragua, where there has been quite a long history, as in many other countries, of neglecting these rights, since 2002, the World Bank has been working hand in hand with the government to pursue major legal policy and institutional reforms. Fast forward 15 years, and today Nicaragua has mapped and titled all 23 ancestral territories of indigenous people, and that is over 30% of the territory of the country makes a huge difference for people who are benefiting from it. Vietnam, the, the, the country did not have secure land rights and actually very similar to my own country that came out of a period of time when that was really neglected to recognize that if they are to have a vibrant economy, to grow fast, to meet the aspirations of their people, this issue has to be tackled decisively. So between 2008 and 2013, Vietnam issued more than 3 million land use certificates. This is important. Equally, and actually for the three women here, even more important is the fact that 60% of these certificates were issued on the name of the wife and the husband women also got land rights. And I can tell you that uh, this has lifted up the economic and political strength of women in Vietnam for the benefit of the whole country, and of course, for their own benefit. Uh, and I'm talking about this because we are now relentlessly pursuing an agenda on legal rights for women across the board. Today, in an average economy, a woman has only three quarters of the legal rights of a man. And land rights, when they are put in existence, are a major factor in bringing the force of women, their entrepreneurship, their strength, for their families, for their communities, their countries. So we are very proud that this week we are joining many partners in launching a campaign, Stand for Her Land, so we can raise awareness to, to this issue. And if uh, people in the audience are interested in joining the campaign, please do so. How many of you have done it? Let me take a little poll. How many of you know that there is campaign that we are st stand for her land going on? Excellent. So tell your neighbors around you what it is, how to join. Put your voice to good use on that topic. Uh, so let's look at the big picture. Why do we have 20 years of this conference? And we will have, of course, more. Because land rights affect everything. If you are in agriculture, it affects how you look after the land and it leads to higher yields. If you are in a city, being able to, to have a land title is so critically important for housing to be built, for the economy to thrive. And especially when we talk about affordable housing, land rights are critical. If you live in an area where the environment uh, is absolutely essential for the well-being of communities, having rights means we will protect the environment uh, better. And of course, rights mean that land can be used as collateral or, or property can be used as collateral, 
and it means an injection for private sector development, essential to create more jobs. And that on its own is absolutely critical, uh, especially uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, Africa. I want to touch on something that, that is actually uh, uh, hugely important, and it is rights matter for peace. They matter for peace because when they are not properly established, they can be the fertile ground, this can be a fertile ground for a conflict. They matter for, for peace if people are displaced, if there is clarity of their ownership, when they come back, they can revitalize rapidly their countries or slide back in a conflict should that not be the case. So when we look around in this room, it is not a surprise so many of you are here because what you work on matters so much. And there is also tremendous possibility to do more because we now live in a world where technology is a great friend. Uh, we can have digital mapping. I, I know there would be a, a keynote later on that particular issue. We can use uh, uh, even our handheld devices. Uh, we can certainly use uh, the uh, computing capacity, artificial intelligence, blockchain, to make much more affordable that ability to establish rights. Uh, we are seeing in the bank these possibilities, and we are taking them uh, forward, especially linked to conditions for doing business. And uh, uh, Simeon, being one of the key authors of uh, doing business, can come up with many more examples than me. I, would, I will give you two. One is from my neighborhood, uh, a country that very recently got its name, finally, and it is, let me see whether people would guess. I'm from Bulgaria, which is the country that got the name? North Macedonia. So North Macedonia, uh, very similar to many other uh, economies uh, uh, coming from, from non-market uh, or, or semi-market economy time, uh, had in 2005 only one third of the uh, apartments registered to their owners. So even if the owner wants to go and figure out, is this mine? The uh, authorities have no idea. There is no proper registration for most of the properties. Uh, and then we work with the, with, the, with, uh, with the authorities there to change property uh, laws and regulations. The result is surveying of land went up from 43 to 99%, practically 100% uh, percent of the country in 10 years. And now, what used to take two months to register a property sale takes two days or less. This has leveraged private investment, and the value of mortgages in Macedonia jumped from 450 million to, uh, to 3.4 billion. Imagine the financial strength that brings. And, uh, and a country that I have to, to mention because my chief of staff is from there, she's from Rwanda, and she would say, how come you, you talked about your country, didn't talk about mine? So here is Rwanda. Rwanda is fantastic. Within a couple of years, Rwanda uh, registered <coughs> 11.5 million parcels. This is practically the whole length of the country. And it moved it in doing business on the indicator registering uh, property from 137th place to number two. And Rwanda did it with unprecedented degree of gender equality. 86% of the land registered is registered in women's name, names. By the way, Rwanda leads on women in parliament uh, like Ethiopia, Rwanda has 50-50 in the government, men, women. Ethiopia uh, also has uh, uh, wisely done the same, the same uh, thing. So we can see tremendous uh, uh, possibilities and we can see tremendous traction. And the question is, what next? And frankly, I think that in this audience, 20 years uh, having this conference 
we have to strive for a very ambitious uh, goal. And I thought I would offer you as what next to flip the percentages from 30% only having their rights established, 17%, 70% not having it, by 2030 to be exactly the opposite, 70% established, 30% still striving. And actually, if we go even further, the more, the better. I want to thank you all for being uh, uh, here for this conference. Wish you a very, very good uh, discussion. You have a great panel. Uh, I want to recognize uh, the colleagues in the bank uh, that have uh, prepared that. I see Edith, the director. Uh, the, actually, the why don't you stand up? This is the father of this conference. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, happy participation. Strive for the largest possible achievement we can together get to. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Kristalina. Klaus, maybe you can. Now that everybody knows uh, the wonderful job that you've, um, that you've done, um, let's proceed with our uh, expert uh, uh, policy uh, panel. We have three very distinguished uh, uh, speakers who have participated firsthand in, um, uh, in reform in their respective uh, countries. To make it, uh, to have plenty of time for uh, questions and answers at the end, what we will do is that I would ask each uh, um, policymaker just uh, to introduce themselves rather than me introducing them. Just a couple of sentences. What? How should we remember you? Uh, and then, uh, and then I'll ask a question uh, to to um, start the uh, the discussion. Um, uh, the distinct, His Excellency, the uh, Minister from Ethiopia, has a presentation. You can already, actually, we can see it. You cannot see it yet, but we will um, we will go through um, through this. And then um, we also have the Chilean experience in um, reducing informality or regularizing uh, 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 property, which uh, a lot of research has been uh, done on this, and Chile leads the way. Uh, in uh, how to do it uh, right. So I would start with uh, our colleague from NEPAD, uh, Esterine, if you can please uh, introduce yourself in a couple of sentences and tell us about um, digital, digitalization and how it helps uh, land uh, registration, land property values. Please. Please. Thank you. Um, I suppose it's good evening now. Good evening. And um, I want to thank the, the World Bank for inviting um, the African Union Development Agency for colleagues who, who are here and who uh, are not aware. The NEPAD agency has recently been transformed by the African Union political leadership from um, NEPAD Planning and Coordination Agency to the African Union Development Agency. So it is the um, technical body of the African Union in charge of um, the development um, program of the continent. Um, I am the uh, director of programs um, at the African Union Development Agency and the issues relating to um, land governance, um, among other things, fall within my um, areas of competences. Um, I've also, um, just as a person, through my work, received a few awards from different governments, including Ethiopia, Cameroon, and um, um, the Women's Conference um, for, well, my interest in supporting and promoting um, women empowerment, um, particularly um, women in rural areas. Now, um, to the question that um, Simone has posed, um, the African Union has um, developed a vision, a 50-year vision, Agenda 2063. And um, when you look through Agenda 2063, the issue of land is at the center 
of the transformational agenda of the continent. Um, I think most Africans who are here, we agree with me that land is really at the center of not only the economic life of Africans, but also the cultural um, life of, of Africans um, as we do value um, uh, land just not as an economic asset, but land as a cultural and something that links us to our ancestral beliefs. Um, so Agenda 2063 in Aspiration 1 that um, speaks to prosperous Africa based on an inclusive growth and sustainable development <coughs> speaks to, has several goals that speak to the issue of land and how it should be utilized to lead to economic transformation in the continent. Um, at the Nepal Agency, from the work that we have done, and I have to say, um, very collaborative with the father of this conference and the team at the bank, we have a land governance program that really um, promote an approach to have land at the center of our economic development. So just as the, the CEO just spoke, um, we see land as central to economic transformation in the continent because as you rightly said, whether you speak of agricultural growth, agric uh, uh, real estate, um, forestry management, biodiversity conservation, um, transportation, all of these are different land uses. And so we believe that we need to have a holistic approach on how we deal with the issues of land. Now, if we take, for instance, agriculture, I just mentioned agriculture 2063. The Continental Policy on Agriculture, which is called CADAP, uh, Malabo, some of you might know about it, speaks about um, in increasing agricultural, agricultural production by 50%. Um, now, how are we going to do this? Um, I think from the conversation and the discussions that we're having and the decisions that have come from the African Union, the use of technology is central to this transformation um, in land management and as, uh, leading to agricultural productivity. So we really believe that um, we can use satellite imagery, um, including things like drones, to be able to map out land um, in the continent, the utilization of such lands, as well as the tracking of the changes um, through time on how different land parcels are being used. Um, we also um, support um, activities through our land governance program um, to work with member states so that they can have this capacity to use such satellite imagery to um, not just map out the land, but the mapping on the land might also help them to increase revenue collection from the land that have been mapped. Um, the, the CEO said, I uh, just uh, made a story, I think I will also, from my own experience, and just to mention the importance of knowing where the lands are and the, and the, the importance of registering this land. I'm from Cameroon. And I bought a parcel of land some years back. Um, and fortunately for me, I think, um, I, I studied law. So I understood the importance of registering my land and having title to that land, which is not something that everybody um, can do, particularly given the complexity of the registration process um, in some of our countries. Anyway, a few years down the line, I had not used the land, but this land was allocated to some other person. And when I went there and I saw somebody had started farming on the land, uh, of course, the only thing that saved me and my land was because I had a title to the land. So a lot of people do not get into uh, situations of conflict because they have not been able to um, get a title to that land. So. From the Nepal perspective, we really are working with member states through our governance program to help to build capacity using satellite industry to make sure that we just don't have um, paper files, 
but use technology to m map and, and, and register <coughs> these lands. Um, we also promote the use of technologies um, to support early warning systems, particularly in the field of agriculture, as most of you know from all the different reports that have been um, written by the IPCC on the impact of climate change. Africa is directly, um, well, Africa, the, all the report says African agriculture will be impacted by climate change. So it's very important if we can give climate information through um, uh, uh, um, technologies that we have so that farmers can plan better. But maybe I can stop here. I'm sure you're going to ask um, another round so that I don't take most of the time. But for NEPAD, given the policy orientations that have come from Agenda 2063, Malabo, um, we all want to use technology to improve land management and governance in the continent. Thank you very much, uh, Esterine. Um, um, we'll go next to um, the uh, Honorable Minister of uh, Urban Development of uh, Ethiopia. Mr. Minister, if you can, in a couple of sentences, tell us what your ministry does, uh, what are your responsibilities, uh, and then you have a presentation uh, uh, for us. Um, uh, just to note that uh, a lot of the early research on the importance of land uh, registry, land uh, uh, cadastres and titling focused on uh, rural areas, at least the importance of, uh, of agriculture. Um, uh, so it's been uh, uh, an entirely new area of, uh, both of research and for policy making to, that makes the point that much of the high value added that one can have through land uh, registration and um, uh, improving property values actually is in rural areas. So hopefully, w yes, please, if you can. Please. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I think uh, my voice is not good. Uh, please applaud guys me. I, I had a common cold and due to that, uh, it may not be convenient for you, but uh, I will try to address my keynotes uh, just starting from now. Uh, the father of this conference may address my gratitude to uh, Mirs uh, Karistelina Georgia for welcoming us here today. It is a great pleasure to participate in this land conference in uh, its 20th uh, anniversary. My name is Jan Tirar Abbai, I'm a Minister of Urban Development and Construction. My ministry is responsible on uh, uh, different urban agendas, uh, mainly focusing on urban land, uh, urban planning, uh, construction, housing development, urban infrastructure and urban resilience, uh, climate resilience, and green development. These all issues are just uh, a concern of uh, our ministry, and we are responsible uh, to execute these all tasks. So uh, having this, uh, said this one, and I'm just going to address my uh, issues. Yeah. For those, uh, maybe uh, you may not know Ethiopia. Uh, uh, Ethiopia is uh, just a uh, birthplace of humankind. You all of uh, uh, here, participants are, I think, uh, your ancestors are from Ethiopia. Do you agree? <laughs> if not, uh, uh, it's good anyways. Uh, just to, to say some uh, pointers, uh, on this ancient land we have above, uh, as you know, Lucy is uh, 3.5 uh, years, 3.2 year, million years old uh, ancestor. And uh, Ethiopia is uh, a populous country next to, uh, I think it is the 12th of the world. More than 100 million uh, people is residing there. So, uh, and among these uh, people, 40% are just uh, young. And we have experienced strong economic growth over the past decade. Uh, Ethiopia per capita income has doubled from uh, 350 US dollar to 210 to uh, 700 in 2017. By now, in 2019, it's forecasted uh, to be uh, $900 per capita per individual. And uh, by now, the economic growth is uh, highly rapiding. And for the last 15 years, it was 11% and twice of regional average of 5.4%. Uh, 
Assuming sustained high growth rates, Ethiopia could reach lowest middle income uh, status by 2025, which is Guinea per capita is 1,560. Ethiopia is urbanizing rapidly and uh, has one of the fastest growing urban population in the world. The rate of urbanization by now is 5.4 percent, and the world means that the urban population will triple to 2034 with 30 percent of the country's people in urban areas by 2028. Cities already play an important role in the economy, contributing to 38 percent of gross domestic product through employing only 15 percent of the total workforce due primarily to the high productivity associated with sectors located mostly in urban areas. If managed proactively, urban population growth presents a huge opportunity to shift the structure and location of economic activity from rural agriculture to the larger and more diversified urban industrial and service sector. Despite progress over the last decade in building institutions and providing infrastructure and service across all urban sectors, there is still much to do, even at today's level of urbanization. Uh, to come with the main conference agenda, land in Ethiopia is a publicly owned. Uh, the last, for the last decade, fast economic development was partially uh, contribution or attributed to public land lease, which helped government to supply land for the priority development leading sectors like manufacturing, industry. Now, eight new big Industries are in development stage, uh, and by now also housing provision for self-help uh, housing development is undergoing in Ethiopia due to, uh, since land is owned by public and it is very uh, a good opportunity for the government to provide uh, for low income and self-help housing development. Despite the above mentioned achievements, as in many cities of the world, Lack of access to land is the single biggest constraint for people, farmers in the urban areas in Ethiopia. With the World Bank supported urbanization review and urban land supply and housing study, some of the big constraints have been identified as follows. Formal land supply has not met with high demand in informal settlements are filling to gap. Unsatisfied demand is well illustrated by land acquisition in cities, where the number of bidders at land acquisition has been 12 to 24 times higher than the number of plots for residential land, and three to seven times higher than available plots of commercial land. Rural to urban land conversion is becoming a source of tension and inequality. By now, at the same time, prevailing practice of land management, lack of incentives for utilization of existing formal land supply and result in low density, a spatial fragmented development and limited mixed use development, reliance on free allotment and the lack of market-based land allocation. Local governments have not been able to supply service land for urban growth due to their limited budget for capital investment. On the other hand, large amount of land has been allocated for free or below market price, not even able to cover the cost of infrastructure investment and service delivery. There are lots lost opportunities for generating lease revenues which could be used for funding infrastructure development and more. Lack of an efficient land cadastre. At, at the moment, our government is trying a lot, but still, uh, there is no full-fledged and comprehensive legal cadastre for urban land management in Ethiopia. Government-led housing production, while delivered substantial number of units, is not meeting the demand. The demand is high, but the, the supply is uh, limited and the curve is uh, highly aparted. Cognizant of the above problems, the government is working to address the issue over the coming months. Land supply and management, establishing a national urban land legal cadastre system. We are trying uh, our best to develop legal cadastre system by now in urban areas. In fact, in rural areas, it, which is very efficient, by now, our government is trying to, to uh, uh, just uh, to expand uh, and so to scale up to urban areas. Strengthening property rights and ensure that the revised compensation law provides adequate compensation for land taking. By now, we are just revising compensation strategies and legal frameworks, laws, and directives. Supply land for the priority development leading sectors like manufacturing industry, 
uh, improve acquisition of land, auction of land to promote efficient land allocation and uses, increasing the efficiency and effectiveness of government's land delivery programs and auctions, introduce land value capture mechanisms for sustaining infrastructure investment and service delivery in urban areas, increase the credibility and desirability of the leases relative to permits and other forms of tenure, and provide incentive and system to encourage conversation to the new leasehold system. Housing and housing finance, in the long run, the government should move towards a role of market enabler, creating a level playing field for the private sector to participate in housing delivery. Before, the government is the sole supplier of housing for uh, especially middle income and uh, low income uh, people of Ethiopian urban centers. Support initiatives by individuals and cooperatives to invest in housing, including by improving their access to land, allowing people to build incremental as we and we they can afford, and permitting people such as those in Kabali houses to invest in improvements without cumbersome clearances. Support housing microfinance programs, help leverage individual savings and encourage incremental housing to help individuals to move up the house ladder. Allow flexible planning, zoning, and engineering standards to ensure that both the housing stock, upgrading of existing settlements, and flow new build are affordable to the majority. Finally, we are exploring public-private partnership where the government and leverage the land to support infrastructure and affordable housing delivery. We are honored to be here and we took forward to learning from other countries to strengthen our ongoing reform efforts. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your uh, Excellency. And our um, third speaker, who is the uh, Secretary at the Ministry of National Assets in Chile, one of the countries that has um, uh, done some of the most advanced uh, um, work in terms of uh, reducing inform informality in the uh, land registration and in general in property. So, uh, Alejandra, uh, please uh, tell us a bit about your success and what are you um, working on now? Thank you very much uh, to the World Bank for the great opportunity given uh, to our country, uh, Chile. Mrs. Cristina Yorieva, Interim President of the World Bank Group and Director General of the World Bank, thank you. My presence is the important conference, Land and Poverty, is under Secretary of the Ministry of National Asset, is on behalf of the government, Chile heard by our President of the Republic, Mr. Sebastián Piñera, and of Minister Felipe Ward Edwards. I'm here to tell you about the scope for overcoming poverty of our ministerial public policy of regularization of the real property, called Chile Propietario. World's main challenge is to short from four years to one year the most the processing of property titling. Shortening this gap is three years means essentially to advance with all Chileans to the integral development that President Piñera has invoked. Our figures are ambition and we are willing to embrace them in our first year on government. We know that well, the same public policies regarding regularly said property play a very important role in overcoming poverty. And this is only possible in a free, in a free social market economy within a democracy rule of law. There is no democracy without a social market economy but there is no social market economy without democracy. That is why we are extremely concerned about the lack of democratic guarantees in countries such as Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. Along with the aforementioned, I would like to emphasize that with, with the 
free economy where private property is guaranteed, we must also protect the right of citizens, and we are have done so in the Minister of National Asset, allowing free access to the good that belong to all Chileans. We don't want luck for democracy, freedom or human rights. Democracy, freedom or human rights are basic principles in overcoming poverty. Thank you very much. Um, and I, I can explain my plan uh, with your question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alejandra. Uh, why don't we, to have more time, um, why don't we have first Adam tell us uh, what's the latest and most exciting in um, satellite imagery and how this is going to help us, uh, and then have some comments, and then have all the questions and uh, comments since you would have a bit more time to think about that. So Adam, please, um, if you can um, um, take the floor, or do you need a bit of time to to prepare? Do you have the presentation? I, uh, I, I, Since I'm aware that many of you have had a full day of uh, <laughs> seminar, so I want to be uh, more efficient and put the Q&A session together so that you can enjoy the good weather that finally we have in Washington, which hasn't been the case for a long, long time. So. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, thank you for the organizers, uh, Klaus, and, and, and to, to the President of the World Bank for, for getting us started um, so well. Um, I, uh, I'm an economist, but my background before that was actually in geography, and I've spent uh, much of my time in the past 20 years thinking about spatial data and linking it with more traditional forms. Oops, of um, this is not appearing on there. Oh, very good, yeah. Um, uh, uh, thinking about uh, spatial data and linking it with more traditional forms of economic and social data. Um, and I'd like to talk to you today specifically about satellite data because I think it pro provides particularly uh, exciting opportunities. Um, so why do we use satellite data uh, for economic research and policy making? Um, satellite data have several features that help us to answer the kinds of causal questions about economic phenomena and the effects of policies that we care about as economists and policymakers. Um, and in particular, there are six advantages that I see as key. I'll talk about each one in turn, uh, highlighting a piece of economics research uh, that uses each and what we learn from it. Um, and this is a talk about data and methods, but throughout I'll show you how they've been used to generate what I think are some very concrete lessons for policy. Although I'm an academic, so maybe what counts as concrete for me is, 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 is um, maybe my standard's too low for that. Um, okay, so the first advantage uh, of satellite data is that they exist where other data do not, right? Collecting data via household surveys and censuses and land cadastres is expensive um, and, and can be logistically difficult. Um, and the same is true of, 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 of many kinds of administrative data that, um, that, that, that the rich countries regularly collect. Uh, now to take an extreme example, um, uh, Yong Sok Lee has used uh, satellite data on lights at night from North Korea, uh, which essentially doesn't publish economic data, to study the effect of sanctions there. Uh, based on some work that, that I've done with some co-authors showing that changes in night lights are correlated with changes in economic activity, or GDP, um, he finds the lights telling a story that sanctions pushed activity towards Pyongyang, the capital, and to cities where uh, trade with China was, was concentrated, um, because of course uh, China was not part of the sanctions re regime. Um, a lack of data, of course, affects many places besides North Korea in less extreme ways. Um, and in, in my work on, on how uh, African cities, uh, focusing on how African cities grow, I've used the same night lights data um, as a measure of city level economic activity because uh, other sources are, are rarely available and almost never for, for every year. My co-authors and I have shown that uh, a drying climate appears to have pushed economic activity into some African cities but not others. Um, and consistent with the simple theory, it's cities that we think already have an export manufacturing base that attract new activity in times of drought, while cities that are more local in orientation are not affected in that particular way, right, of, of attracting more activity in people. 
Um, I've also used these lights data to look at how transport costs affect African cities. Um, and others have used, uh, have, have used them to look at the effects of, of refugee camps on, on local econ economic activity, among, among many other topics. OK, a second advantage is that data are often collected at extremely high resolution, uh, sometimes now less than one meter. Um, and Seema Jaya Chandran and her co-authors have, have used this feature to evaluate a program paying people in rural Uganda not to cut down trees, um, the payment for ecosystem services, essentially. Um, and the satellite data are fine enough that you can really look at individual trees um, and assign them to the land of an individual household. This image showed what happened in four particular sample locations corresponding to, to each row. Uh, the, the first two columns show trees at the beginning and the, and, and the end, and the last column shows changes in tree cover. And critically, they, they, because they're spatial data, they could link these data with, house, with the household survey about the program and who received it and who didn't um, using the location of each household's land. What they found was that uh, people who were randomly assigned to the payments group, or villages that were randomly assigned to the payments group, cut down substantially fewer trees than a control group that did not receive payments without displacing tree harvesting onto other lands. And the difference was large enough uh, that even if these effects were completely undone in four years, say, um, then this delay would actually be a cost-effective means of decreasing carbon emissions. A third advantage uh, is that repeat measurements with satellites are extremely cheap. <coughs> once you develop the met, once you send up the satellite, once you develop the methods for measuring something once, the satellite keeps orbiting and keeps collecting data. So you can often apply the same algorithm to next month or next year's data. Um, a nice example of this work, uh, 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 of this particular feature, is work on ethnic patronage uh, in the Kibera neighborhood of Nairobi, Kenya. Ben Marks, Te uh, Thomas Stoker, and Tavneet Suri wanted to look at the rents people pay in, the, in those neighborhoods adjusted by the, qual the housing quality they received. Um, but housing quality can vary over time. Uh, and to get a so to get a proxy for that, they measured the reflectance of the metal roofs. Um, roofs get less reflective as they get rustier. Um, and that's what's going on here in the, in the, uh, uh, in the bottom box, right, the, that's getting, going from bright to dark. Um, where, whereas when they get replaced, they get lighter, which is what's happening in, in the top box from, from left to right, right? And they were able to get four measures of this reflectance uh, for the whole neighborhood over a short period of time. And again, of course, critically, they could link the image of each house with a survey respondent to see, to, um, to see what they're, uh, to, to get many other features that you can only get from talking to people as opposed to, to looking at their house from, from space. And they're, they're able then to document and quantify the fact that that renters pay less rent and get better housing quality uh, when they're of the same ethnicity as the local political boss. Um, whereas, uh, conversely, they, they pay more rent and they get worse housing quality on average uh, when, their landlord, when their landlord is of the same ethnicity as the local political boss. Okay. Now, in addition to being available for many points in time, uh, most satellites have data available for nearly the whole world on a regular basis. Okay. Uh, and this was particularly useful for a study on the effect of subway systems on air pollution by Marco Gonzalez Navarro, Matt Turner, and others. They wanted to see whether uh, air pollution fell in the weeks and months after subways opened, uh, as is shown, oops, uh, let me see, as is shown here uh, in, in Bangalore in 2014. So this is just comparing two months in, in, in Bangalore, right? Um, the problem with this is that not many subway, not many cities have seen subways open in the past 20 years, and that makes it difficult to do statistical analysis. Right? But conveniently, the satellite data on particulate matter are available for the whole world, so they are able to gather satellite data for, um, for the opening of each subway stop in, in the 42 cities that were opening subway systems over, over this 15-year uh, period. To link to the again to link to these pollu uh, to, to to these pollution data, and so having those uh, and, and and so having that global coverage was was really critical for that. This is just showing that uh, that's one day of coverage at the top because on any given day there's clouds, but over a longer period you're getting data for for the whole world. Um, and the results are, are quite striking. They find that subways substantially reduce uh, particulates, uh, particulate matter pollution. 
um, and that the effect doesn't seem to decrease for as long as they can see, which is actually up to, uh, in, in their sample, is actually up to eight years after opening. This is somewhat surprising because lots of other work predicts that new drivers will, predict, will, um, will dampen the, the, this effect by exploiting the reduction in car traffic from, from having these new subways. A related point to the worldwide coverage is that satellites are measuring the same quantity everywhere. They don't turn off or change their method uh, when they cross a national border, right? They don't, in some sense, know that they're crossing a national border, right? Um, and so uh, Robin Burgess, Francisco Costa, and Ben Olkin have exploited this idea to consider the effect of a policy that Brazil introduced in 2006 um, to reduce deforestation. There are lots of reasons why deforestation rates change from year to year, including, for example, the market price of lumber, um, uh, of, of timber. Uh, so it's hard to distinguish this policy from other phenomena. So what they do is they look at, essentially, they look at transects uh, approaching the border from each side to compare Brazil with all of its neighbors. So in the early years, which are shown in the top row here, right, um, you can see that as you cross the border, which means within each subgraph moving from left to right, um, uh, the border being that, that vertical red line in the middle of each subgraph, um, Rates of deforestation, which was what we're graphing on the vertical axis, they jump uh, a lot, right? They, they jump up as soon as you cross the border into Brazil in each of the early years, right? But starting in 2006, which is the, which is the year in the, at the beginning of the second row, and, and uh, that differential falls a lot, and pretty, mu pretty soon it's barely there, right? So this is quite striking evidence that something changed in Brazil, something important changed in Brazil relative to its neighbors in 2006. And they use other evidence to argue that, that this policy is the most likely candidate. The last advantage I'll, I'll highlight is that is the independence of satellites from typical reporting method, methods. This is especially important when you think that local officials might have an incentive to underreport, uh, for example, environmental damage. In an earlier paper, uh, Burgess and co-authors look at how deforestation changed during the rapid redistricting that, that occurred in Indonesia in the 2000s. By exploiting some quirks in the timing of these changes, they show that redistricting led to uh, more rapid deforestation. And their story is that redistricting led to increased competition between districts for the revenue from legal and illegal deforesta uh, uh, deforestation. So it's important to get a consistent view of what's happening independent of any kind of reporting changes that might have happened, uh, that, that might have occurred when, when the redistricting was happening as well. So I've given you uh, examples related to city growth, to urban land use, to deforestation, uh, pollution. Um, there are more and more now in economics and of course a much longer tradition in other fields, especially environmental science. Um, and I hope that these uh, topics and examples are of particular interest to land ministries and, and other people focusing on land. There's also uh, work related to mining, to tourism, um, using, these kinds of, uh, using these kinds of data. Um, and another area that I think is particularly exciting for the future is, is agriculture. Um, it's not easy to learn about crop choice or yield from a single satellite image, right? But once you can get uh, multiple images per growing season, or even better, images every day, um, it starts becoming possible to learn uh, an enormous amount uh, about the agricultural economy. Um, and with, with high frequency, high resolution images, I expect that we will be able to learn a lot about the, ch the choices of individual farmers at an increasingly low cost. Of course, once again, uh, the, uh, it's important to, to be able to link that to the land system to know which farmers we're, we're looking at, right? Um, and I, 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 g I gather even from earlier presentations today that that day is even sooner than I had thought with some, some new satellites that are already up. Now, I recognize that I sound like a, a cheerleader for this technology. Um, I believe that it holds great promise, uh, but I don't want to give, the, give you the impression uh, that it can replace traditional data sources or that it's, not, or that it's without problems. Um, the view from above is a powerful one, uh, but it's not a complete one. So for example, a, a, any given satellite image is, is a snapshot at one instant in time. Um, it's not the summary of a day or a month that you could get, for example, from a, from a continuous pollution monitor, right? Um, 
to take another example, the most recent night light satellites are, are telling us about um, what's going on at two in the morning, whereas the old satellites were telling us what was happening in the early evening. And so we're, we're still gonna have to study whether it's, it's giving us a, a similar, uh, um, what their relationship is with economic activity and how that's changed. It's still, I think, somewhat difficult to go from a satellite image to objects like building footprints. Computers are getting better and better in that, at that, but it's not yet routine, so it still does require some human labor to do, to do that well. Um, and while it's true, as, as I said before, that um, satellites generally operate the same way regardless of their location, um, context, of course, still does matter. Um, so for example, an algorithm that's good at distinguishing a city from a uh, surrounding forest is not always going to be able to distinguish a, a city from a surrounding desert. So as in everything, it's important to know your data before, inter before interpreting it. Um, so to briefly summarize, satellites provide uh, data for, for data poor contexts, often at high resolution, with frequent repeat measurement for the whole world, consistently across borders, in a way that's relatively difficult to falsify. They're not magic. Um, but as the price of data and the processing power goes down and algorithms for analyzing them get better and better, I believe that they hold enormous potential for learning about land and, and how people use it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam. Very concise and with lots of uh, new and interesting uh, research. Um, so we've been very disciplined, so we have nearly half an hour for uh, questions and uh, comments. Um, we have passed some uh, cards to you, so you can write your uh, question or uh, comment. So please write in the next few minutes and then pass them on to the sites of the audience so that um, we can collect them. We will start uh, the first comments uh, by inviting Professor Ndungu, who just um, uh, joined us. He has had a distinguished career in several areas, um, public policy, central banking, uh, uh, academia, as I mentioned. So we will give him the floor first uh, uh, so that you have some time to also think of your uh, questions and uh, the floor will be next uh, yours. Professor, please. Thank you very much. I, let me apologize for coming late. Um, I got lost somewhere in the building. I think I found myself in room 7100 where there was a good big poster of this conference, but nobody inside. And then I thought, then I checked again, then I realized that actually it's, it's tomorrow, the meeting there is tomorrow. I didn't anticipate such a large meeting. Let me say that I'm very happy to be here, and I think this is a topical issue, especially in Africa, and especially from the policymaking point of view. My first entry to this subject matter is that uh, Krauss and uh, the AERC are actually helping training academic, uh, 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 some PhD students in the University of Cape Town in this, in, in this course, the relevance of this. And that is why coming from the African Economic Research Consortium is very, very important because we try and train capacity of we have, we have managed to raise capacity in the, in the last 30 years in Africa through research, graduate training, and even policy outreach. And this becomes a very topical issue because it tells us about how much we know in terms of the land use in Africa and how much we need to know and how land is used. And of course now, the new technology is providing us with even better data to actually track how land is being used and all that. In my whole life, I always watched in terms of what happens to land use across countries, what happens to productivity in agricultural sector. Right now, everybody is concerned about agriculture in the rural Africa. Everybody is running away from agriculture, and one of them, one of the most important uh, issues is actually the fragility of the sector itself in terms of extreme uh, conditions of weather. But coming back to the whole issue of uh, land, I, I, I also was, when I was listening to so many of the comments that were being made, then I remembered that uh, in, I've been in the financial sector in Kenya, and one of the collateral that you have to, pro you can provide without actually, I, I mean, it is actually accepted, it's actually land and buildings. Then it means that our life revolves around land and buildings, but then the most, uh, should I say, contentious issue is actually the, 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 the property rights around the land issue. And then when we come to 
even the issues of economic uh, uh, well-being, then you find that in areas where individual land titles exist and even there's an active land market, then also it is correlated in terms of the investments in land. But when you get to areas where there is communal land, then you find that the investment in land is actually low. So essentially, I'm very happy about how we can actually use the, the, the data, but I'm also very conscious that uh, we are going to be perhaps scale up capacity in this area because of the policy uh, and the reluctance in terms of policy or in terms of moving into land rights and social economic development. We know what is the problem, but we have taken so long even to deal with the problem. And it's only, especially in Africa, that this becomes a problem. I'm very happy that uh, in our own capacity building, we would like to look at these aspects in terms of what are the social economic uh, uh, dimensions to it. How do we use this data, actually even to track changes over time in terms of land use, in terms of uh, even what about uh, uh, in terms of land use itself and the yield in terms of agricultural sector? Everybody is complaining about declining aggregate demand in rural Africa. It's because of the whole issue about land, the whole issue about resources around the land, and even investment in land. The second aspect that I thought you have uh, actually uh, shown, uh, and this even uh, I think uh, it becomes very clear, is that how do we ca how can we track active land market and how can we support that in terms of the policy terrain that is available or is available to us. For me, this is a v these are very important uh, points. Actually, and this is something that we're going to try and push policy in that, in that direction. Because I, I do believe, I know the data you're saying is no magic. You can actually, you cannot falsify, but at the same time, would like to see what is most applicable when we go to the rural uh, land market, or rural, rural land issues, and even trying to improve uh, the, the policies around the land. I've looked at several studies. I'm not a very, an expert in this area, but I'm an, I'm an expert in terms of looking at markets themselves. I look at markets themselves. And I have actually, I believe that having seen the data, then we can go back and ask ourselves, what are the institutional issues that we really need to improve? And especially when it comes to land use, when it comes to property rights, and when it comes to even improving the ways we use rural land. And even the land institutions themselves that helps us to incentivize what is available in the land. So I'm very happy that we can combine the data we have with the socioeconomic data that we would like to have. And then what are the emerging issues, the emerging policy issues that are required in terms of what data exist, what the economic uh, dimensions exist, and how do we prevent conflict around which surrounds the land issue. Last week we had a conference, that's why I, became, I came late, uh, had to travel this mor uh, yesterday morning. We had a conference in our, in, uh, on our, in our senior policy seminars in Harare. And it was focusing on fragility of growth in Africa. But we, we, we had to break it down in terms of even those countries that are conf coming from conflict, those countries that are in conflict, and those countries that are not in conflict, but they have sectors that are also very fragile. Those fragile contexts revolve around land use and land itself. And even the policies, the policy failure or an institutional failure problem that actually promotes an institutional failure problem. So it, be, it becomes very important. We start from data, but we go to socioeconomic and even political issues that are becoming very, very interesting. So essentially, I'm sure this is going to invite a lot of research work and even policy dimension in this area. So thank you very much. I don't want to take time, but I think we can assemble the questions and also share them across. And uh, in the life of this, and the, ta the, sp the time of the conference, we are going maybe to tackle so many issues. Maybe I'll get out of this conference uh, uh, feeling very, uh, should I say, enlightened in terms of the areas I, I focus on in terms of policy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. So we have start receiving, uh, started receiving some questions from, um, uh, from the audience. Please think of other questions while we uh, address the first few. So first there is a question from our colleague from NEPAD on the impact of uh, titled land on food security. So maybe we start with you, uh, Esterine, uh, food security and uh, titled land, or in general land uh, registration and improvements in land property rights, please. Thank you. Um, I think this is a really 
important um, question. Um, I think the earlier uh, uh, um, statements that have been made, um, the issue of ownership and titling has been mentioned. Mm -hmm. And um, I think from what we have seen through the work that we do, um, supporting member states to implement the CADAP framework, which is the Comprehensive Agricultural Investment Program in Africa, um, the importance of smallholder farmers to own their land is of critical importance. As we know, um, perhaps almost um, 70 to 85 percent of Africa's agriculture is done by smallholder farmers. If you take that number, you break it, you look at it further, you will see that again, maybe 60 to 70 percent of the smallholder farmers are women farmers. Now, when we talk about food security, if you don't have title to your land, the complications of getting credit, um, financial credit, or inputs that you can reinvest in your farm to increase your production and productivity is limited. So it is really the, your ability to be able to raise credit to invest in your farm um, so that you can increase your production or make any kind of investment is dependent on whether you have or you can prove your ownership of that land. So I think this is um, something that really cannot be overemphasized, that for, you to, for the farmers to be able to invest, particularly the smallholder farmers, um, they need to have, to show that they own land, you have guarantee that um, they can go to the bank and get credit um, and invest in the land because for you to do that, at least you have to have security of tenure. Mm -hmm. So it's come out a lot from the small farmers that we, we, we work with, that NEPAD engage with in order to cut up process, that that security of tenure is so critical for investment to happen on the land. So whether by the farmers themselves to be able to take credit or to work with private sector to um, get inputs, um, um, they need some kind of guarantee. Mm -hmm. And in most cases, that guarantee is your ability to show that you have title. So the link in terms of, 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 of um, food security and land ownership is through your ability to demonstrate that you have um, title over the land and you can make long-term investment um, in order to increase production and productivity. Thank you very much. Um, there are several questions on democracy and uh, market reform, democracy and the process of land uh, uh, registration. So I'll ask several of the uh, participants. Starting first with Adam. Adam, is there research that links this either cross country or within country that basically asks the question, are democracies better at uh, registering uh, property, at giving rights uh, and enforcing these rights, or it's still still too early in this uh, in this work? Uh, I'm I'm not aware of it, although I'd say that particular aspect is not, so, so I, I, I'm he here at this conference to learn I'm, I'm not a land person per se, or land policy person per se, so I, I, I'm, I'm, but I'm not aware of any uh, off the top of my head, sorry. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Minister, in your work in Ethiopia, do you see with, uh, with democracy uh, developing, do you see this link between more democratic governments like, like yours and uh, f faster process, progress in terms of uh, land registration, basically giving, uh, securing the rule of law? Yeah, uh, yes, of course. I think the democracy is, uh, it's not. It's, an, it's a broad concept, and uh, for market economy, basically, especially on urban land development activities, what we are doing in urban areas and in uh, every developmental activities uh, are just. It requires uh, the market economy uh, requires democracy. I think so. Uh, what we are developing, uh, what we are doing, and what we are planning is. Just considering all the involvement of uh, every society and every people and every uh, uh, every angle at every angle, every person are involved in uh, every developmental activities. That's why the market economy requires democracy and understanding such a way. 
There are uh, two more questions that raised by the participants, I think. Yes, please. If what you can just summarize quickly the one question. One is the women beneficiaries. Bunny, women beneficiaries on housing development. As I, as I mentioned in my key speech, uh, women are uh, prioritized on uh, direct use. 30% of how every housing development, especially on saving, are the first priority gave for women to, to, to be beneficial on housing development. The other thing is uh, the urban rural migration, I think, influx uh, most of the time. There are central government uh, is, that give uh, a power for local governments. In fact, it is impossible to, 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 to stop migration from rural area to urban area through directive. Rather, our government is uh, just uh, exercising, developing many urban centers to accommodate uh, those uh, migrants from rural area to uh, big cities like Addis Ababa. Mm -hmm. That's why we are, uh, we are targeting to develop industrial parks in eight urban areas throughout the country. Thank you very much. Thank you. And was there one more question or um, you managed to cover? You managed to cover, okay. Um, there are also two questions to the um, uh, Chilean secretary. Um, one was broader, very similar to the uh, question to um, His Excellency the Ethiopian uh, Minister on Democracy and Reform. So does democracy help? Do democratic institutions uh, uphold uh, the rule of law? And the second question was more specific to the Chilean uh, reform experience. So please, Ms. Secretary. Bueno, para asegurar el registro de la propiedad de, de la regularización que nosotros hacemos es porque el trámite que hace bienes nacionales conlleva la inscripción del rol en el servicio de impuestos internos y luego la inscripción de la propiedad en el conservador de bienes raíces. Es una... Es una regularización que se entrega un título de dominio que está absolutamente protegido por todas nuestras normas y leyes para que la persona obtenga el título sin ninguna dificultad después de vender, arrendar o la ocupación que estime conveniente. Ok. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Macarena. I work uh, with the Under Secretary in the Minister, uh, Minister of National Assets, and I'm going to translate the the answer that she gave. Um, okay, in the process of the regularization of private property, uh, the final process uh, it ends uh, at inscription. Uh, so that uh, guarantees uh, the the line is uh, is linked and that is a legal process. Okay. Thank you. Bueno, respecto de la afirmación que yo hago de la importancia de la democracia para la superación de la pobreza, decir primero que todo que nuestro Plan Nacional de Regularización de la Propiedad Raíz es una decisión política. Y después decir que en esa decisión nosotros como Ministerio contamos con un decreto ley que puede regularizar la propiedad privada. Y lo que nos ha pedido el Presidente de la República es precisamente lograr que las personas, las familias que están en situación de pobreza y que tienen terrenos privados que nosotros podemos regularizar, podamos hacerlo en el menor tiempo posible para que ellos puedan pasar a una situación o una circunstancia que nosotros es muy fuerte en nuestro país, que es la clase media. El presidente nos ha convocado a avanzar a un desarrollo integral. Para ello, queremos que todos podamos avanzar a ese desarrollo. Entonces, este es un decreto ley que involucra la propiedad privada. Los privados aportan de la siguiente manera. Hemos suscrito convenios 
con las universidades más importantes de nuestro país. Los jóvenes que estudiaron con becas del Estado y que estudian eh, y que egresan ayudan a nuestro ministerio en la regularización y eso es un aporte que es privado de, algún man, de alguna manera. También los abogados que quieran eh, aportar con la regularización de la propiedad sin que nosotros tengamos que entregarles un honorario, lo están haciendo también, es un aporte privado. Eh, por lo tanto, es un contrato social que tenemos con los privados para ayudar a estas familias a superar la pobreza y pasar eh, a ser familias que puedan eh, apostar eh, a todos los beneficios que entrega el Estado y pasar a ser familias de clase media. The interpreter has a tough time, clearly. <laughs> Good luck with that. She's Chilean, so understand my my program. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, first, about the relevance of the democracy, uh, the first thing is that this is a political decision. So we have to make it. Uh, and we have to make it because this is going to be a very good thing for the people. And for the people, they need, the, they, uh, they're, they are in a situation uh, about they need an, an improvement, so this is a political decision. Um, uh, one of the principal things have to um, related to this process uh, be shorter. So uh, this is a very important situation because uh, in this plan the process is going to be and it's going to be uh, in a very short time, okay, a, a, a less time than before. And um, with the private sector, uh, there is a, a different kind of cooperation that the minister is increasing uh, with uh, some work, uh, for example, in a technical issues like, uh, uh, like measuring of different parts of the plan. So this is a, an actual cooperation and an active cooperation with the private sector. Um, me gustaría agregar también que el, el socio estratégico más importante que tiene este plan son los 345 municipios que, están, eh, eh, que tienen el ejercicio democrático en nuestro país. Eso es muy importante porque eso permite que las personas que quieran regularizar a través de nuestro ministerio eh, puedan llegar a... Eh, a estos gobiernos locales pedir el trámite y mediante un convenio los municipios apoyan esta iniciativa y permiten que muchas más chilenos que están en esta situación puedan eh, obtener su título de dominio. Ok. And, um The thing is that we are an, a practical cooperation with the local uh, uh, local government. So uh, this is very important because all the plan is uh, ha is having a direct relation with the people and with the people that lives in the local areas. So this is very important. Thank you very much. We have two more um, uh, questions. One um, about differences across African countries and especially countries members of NEPAD uh, in terms of the take up of uh, land registration uh, reforms and perhaps the latest technology of, uh, uh, of that. Esterine, please, maybe you can share some thoughts. Thank you. Um, well, the Let me, just, let me just start by saying the, the African Union, um, or under the African Union, they has a few policies that um, have been passed, which means that these are African Union policies, and therefore all member states have to implement them. For instance, the land um, policy framework and guidelines um, that have been passed, as well as the Nairobi Plan of Action. These are continental documents. 
and um, each member state, the four African Union member states have to implement them, but obviously um, the rate of implementation and uptake is different between countries. Um, what we've tried to do in the NEPAD program is to identify countries that are at different stages so that we can learn from some um, and use their experiences to help build capacity in other um, African countries. So uh, examples have been made here, um, for, for instance, Rwanda, mm -hmm. um, Ethiopia, on the way that they are, um, the improvements they've made in terms of land registration, um, given joint ownership and title f between a husband and a wife. Um, we think these are some good practices and we do have a program called GCAPS, um, Gender Climate Agricultural Support Program, where we are trying to not, not replicate, but share the lessons um, from countries that have made such advances with other countries that are participating in the program so they can then look at their own system and see how they can um, um, take in such um, best or good practices. So our, our, our approach really is, is the, 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 each country is different. And what we have noticed is, particularly when you come to data, um, you, on administrative data or socioeconomic data and special data, they are, they are in various different, different levels. And the capacity of the institutions in the countries are also at different stages. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're not following a cookie cutter approach. Um, our approach is to engage with the countries, um, look at the situation, do a situational analysis of where they are and how they are implementing um, land reform policies, and then see what support we need to um, give to them or we can give to them. And um, in our land governance program, in which we are co collaborating with um, the World Bank, um, Klaus's outfit, we are looking at how to strengthen these capacities in countries to collect administrative data, building on the work that the World Bank did earlier on the land governance program on administrative data, mm -hmm. um, and supporting them on that, supporting them on, on building capacity to collect socioeconomic data, as well as um, giving them training on the use of, of, of special technologies. So um, we, um, as, I, as I mentioned, um, have this land governance program and the other program I mentioned, GCAPS, where we work with the countries to identify their needs. So where they are and what they need, they, they, they think is more useful for them, if you like, in the, the value chain and decision making as far as land um, policy is concerned. So um, under our land program, we are actually working right now with about eight countries, helping them to set up um, policy decks in their countries and to build their capacity to um, not only collect, but do some analytical work um, in, the, in, 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 in a combined manner. So using administrative data, socioeconomic data, and spatial data to inform policy and investment programs in their countries. Thank you very much. Uh, one fairly difficult question, I think, um, which is on how do you deal in your uh, policy reforms with ancestral lands, tribal lands, uh, so-called traditional lands? To what extent this is a topic that comes up in your work in Ethiopia, Your Excellency? Um, and can you share some experience? Okay, good. I think uh, the question is uh, just directly go to rural uh, uh, land acquisition system. And in Ethiopia, rural, either rural or urban land, it is uh, uh, in, the, in our land policy, it is, land is owned by the public. Uh, public ownership gives right to intervene in every developmental aspects. Uh, in rural areas, uh, the ancestral uh, or indigenous community rights is not violated because it gives right by its own uh, proclamation. It is uh, supported by proclamation directives, and uh, there are also regulations. They support the regulations and the legal framework support them to have a use right, and the title did give this uh, use right. 
So uh, in Ethiopia, the, as land is owned by the public, it's not a, a problem even in rural areas. In urban areas, which is quite different because uh, we do have a compensation uh, uh, proclamation, directives and regulations. Every uh, individual has a right to use that land, but during uh, when the government have an interest to develop that land, they have a right to get uh, appropriate compensation. So it's not a challenge for Ethiopia. Uh, this is uh, the fact what just we're uh, dealing about. Thank you. Thank you. And the last question, so we finish on time, is to our keynote speaker, Adam, which is on so some doubts about satellite imagery. Um, I'll, I'll paraphrase. So can you uh, talk briefly about the cost of acquiring high resolution imagery and then the analysis? What about cloud cover? So to what extent that affects uh, uh, the work that is done? Uh, and finally, capacity building needed um, to actually analyze this uh, imagery. Adam. Thank you. Uh, so I think that the, um, briefly to all three, I think it, it varies for all of them. Um, let me see. On cost, um, there's an increasing amount of data that are just completely freely available. So I was at a session earlier today talking about the Sentinel data from the European Union. These are data that are um, on the order of 10 meters, on the order of every five days, and I believe they're freely available. So, so just getting the data are, is, is increasingly possible. Um, and cloud systems such as Google Earth Engine also distribute things like the Landsat archive from, from the US government, which um, again, uh, freely. So, so, enough, so cost is, of data is, I think, less of an issue than it, than it was for, for many, many years. Cost of processing is, will vary again if it's, you know, Google Earth Engine allows you to do much of this for free. Um, but, but if you want to do more custom things, it's harder. And that gets also to the capacity, right? I mean, this is technical stuff. Um, depending on what you want to do. So the kind of people, uh, other economists have, have, have said that the kind of stuff I've done with satellite data, we will think of in a few years as the horse and buggy days of, of satellite data. In the grand scheme, it's actually fairly easy to do on, on the PC that sits on your, that sits on your desk, um, but that gets much more complicated, uh, can get much more complicated depending on what you want to detect. And then finally, um, cloud cover absolutely matters, you know, depending on you know on, on your application right and so um, you can't for, for most things you want to see you you can't see through you cannot see through clouds um, so we're often sampling from not cloudy days that's a big problem if you want to look at the rainforest um, potentially right and so but it's less of a problem in, in, in other places so so you, so it's, it's absolutely something that all of these analyses have to have to think carefully about and whoever asked it I'd be happy to talk to you more about it if you're if you're interested Thank you. I think we are exactly at the right time to uh, wrap up. Thank you for all the participants. Please enjoy your evening in Washington since there are a couple more days of hard work for those of you who have um, uh, joined us for this, uh, for this conference. Thank you again to everybody and enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Get better. <laughs>